So good afternoon, good morning, um, good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Hervé Baches. I'm dermatologist in Paris, France, and I'm vice president and president-elect of the International Psoriasis Council. And I have the great honor to uh, chair today this uh, uh, episode of the global webinar series dedicated to the immunology in the perspective of comorbidities and early intervention. So on behalf of the IP IPC, I would like to uh, welcome you and uh, obviously to wish you a very happy uh, and uh, healthy new year. We I would like also to uh, thank the, uh, uh, our sponsors um, of this webinar, uh, namely Abvi and uh, uh, Eli, uh, Lily, uh, 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 and uh, a company uh, for their uh, support. Um, it's very crucial. Without them, we couldn't uh, organize these webinars. This webinar will last uh, uh, one hour. Uh, it's being recorded. The audio is muted, so please ask the, your question through the Q&A uh, space. Uh, there is the Q&A space and the chat space that uh, the moderator, meaning me, uh, will check uh, on a regular basis. Um, and uh, recording will be uh, available post the, uh, this event at uh, So a, a quick introduction uh, to the International Psoriasis uh, Council. So IPC was founded in uh, 2004. Uh, it's a dermatologist-led voluntary global non-for-profit organization. Uh, it uh, networks more, more than uh, 100 psoriasis experts uh, worldwide. It's global, uh, and there is a more and more uh, balanced uh, geographic and uh, uh, um, gender uh, representation. Um, the vision uh, of IPC is to reach uh, the uh, ultimate goal of a world free of psoriasis. We believe that the psoriasis patients, no matter where they live, um, no matter how complex their symptoms are, should have access to the best care uh, available. Our mission is to improve uh, the care of the people with psoriasis worldwide through research, education, and advocacy. Um, and these uh, three axes are uh, 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 all very crucial for our PC. Uh, 128 uh, uh, board members and councillors representing 35 countries are gathered in this network. Uh, the IPC board members and councillors volunteer their time to implement all IPC programs and activities and annually 95% participate in IPC activities. And this is an opportunity to thank all of them uh, who participated in the past and will participate in the uh, present and future. Uh, the key areas of focus are listed here, access to care, research, medical education, and global outreach, as I mentioned before. Uh, we have a lot of uh, resources uh, and uh, accessible online through our Knowledge Center, the Take 10 video series, uh, the uh, on-demand symposia, the video library, uh, the calendar of uh, forthcoming events, the Congress reports, the fellowship program, uh, the Psoriasis Review Newsletter, and the COVID Resource Center, uh, which is uh, regularly uh, updated. Um, you can see here are uh, some uh, events you might pencil in your calendars, the global webinar series. Uh, today is the first of the calendar year. It will be followed uh, in uh, March uh, by several very appealing uh, uh, topics, uh, how to organize a sizes clinic in the future uh, and, uh, uh, and other um, uh, topics uh, uh, very important. And we have also some videos of previous webinars accessible on IPC websites, personalized medicine, psoriasis with a focus on stratification biomarkers and personalized medicine uh, with a focus on, uh, uh, on registries, big data and artificial intelligence. 
Uh, today is the uh, first of the uh, uh, New Year uh, global webinar series, the number three of the whole global webinars. Um, we have a, a, a very distinguished uh, uh, and amazing faculty, um, starting with uh, Liv Edsmo. Uh, uh, she is a dermatologist, immunologist. She is a professor of translational um, uh, 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 skin immunology, and she is uh, the new director of the Leo Foundation Skin Immunology Research Center uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, Paul M Professor Paul Emery is, is a worldwide known uh, rheumatologist. He's been uh, the head of the rheumatology uh, center in Leeds, UK, uh, where uh, he was uh, uh, also during this period, he was appointed as a, a president of the URAR, uh, the European Society for uh, Rheumatology. Uh, he has been the author of more than uh, 1,100 uh, of a peer review uh, publication uh, and uh, has been uh, 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 ordered or, or received the uh, order of the British Empire for our services in rheumatology by the uh, Queen. Um, uh, Professor Luigi Naldi uh, is a worldwide known uh, epidemiologist and dermatologist. Uh, he is the lead of the Central Studi GZ in Bergamo in Italy, um, and uh, both as a clinician and as a scientist, uh, he knows uh, a lot about the cottage of comorbidities uh, in, in, in psoriasis. Uh, so thanks uh, to uh, all the speakers for accepting the invitation of IPC to deliver uh, their uh, uh, content today. Um, and uh, you, can, you can see that we have a, a, a very robust agenda. Um, Luigi Naldi uh, will address the prevention of comorbidities, uh, associated disease, um, and uh, then Professor Emery will address the early intervention in rheumatology, what are the expectations? And then Professor uh, Liv Etzmo will address uh, the uh, uh, clinically relevant translational immunology, uh, what it tells, what uh, uh, it reveals, uh, the science behind uh, the disease memory, wh what is missing. Uh, Professor Itzmo uh, was uh, instrumental in the discovery of the role of resident memory uh, T cells in the skin. So it's my pleasure uh, now uh, to uh, 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 stop sharing uh, my screen and uh, to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Luigi Naldi. Uh, uh, Luigi, glad to have you. Thank you for being here. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, this is my conflict of interest. And um, these are the points I like to cover very briefly. And uh, let's start from definitions. Uh, in essence, uh, comorbidity is a statistical concept. It refers to the co-occurrence of two diseases in the population at a rate which is higher than expected by chance alone. And uh, this definition allows to separate comorbidity from the simple co-occurrence of two conditions as expected by chance. Basically, there, there are two different modalities which can be involved in the statistical association. Either one disease is the cause of the other one, and many times we refer to such a situation in, with the term of complication, or on the other hand, the two diseases may share common risk factor, such as for basal cell carcinoma and melanoma. And in many situations, there is a sort of combination of these two modalities. Let's move to psoriasis. And we know that psoriasis is associated with several extracutaneous pathological conditions and it is considered nowadays as a systemic disorder. I will focus a little bit on a metabolic syndrome. The statistical association of psoriasis with single components of the metabolic syndrome, such as diabetes, and with the consequences of the metabolic syndrome, such as cardiovascular disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disorder is well documented. And here are summarized 
the association in terms of the, of the ratio or uh, in rates. And uh, uh, the statistical association may at least partly be explained by um, these association with uh, smoking and body mass index. We know that uh, obesity and smoking influence the development of psoriasis. And these factors are more prevalent among psoriatic patients as compared with the general population. But another possible non-exclusive explanation is the potential effect of chronic inflammation, particularly inflammation originating from epithelial tissues on the metabolic component, compartment. There are a number of cytokines which can be produced in psoriasis that could affect single components of the metabolic syndrome as just summarized in this picture. Interesting, even a localized inflammatory condition so, such as periodontal disease has a documented association with cardiovascular diseases. And it is of note that recently parodontitis has been associated with psoriasis. We cannot make any direct inference from this as observation, but it is worth noting them. Let's move to uh, consider the consequences of recognizing psoriasis as a systemic disease. Several recent uh, consensus documents and the guidelines has been delivered focusing on comorbidity screening and management in psoriasis. What these documents lack, in my opinion, is a clear statement about the responsibility of dermatologists with respect to the management of comorbidities in a way similar to this document in rheumatology, where is stated that rheumatology is the rheumatology is irresponsible for CVD risk management in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory disease. Um, over, uh, let's say overweight and obesity are, in my opinion, particularly worth of consideration. Obesity plays a key role among modifiable, modifiable risk factor for psoriasis and it is an important component of the metabolic syndrome. It also affects the risk of developing arthritis. Psoriasis, obesity seems to influence disease severity as uh, documented in this survey. And uh, it influences treatment response irrespective of the drug being prescribed as documented in this study from the SOCARE registry in Italy. And uh, also it is uh, impact, it, it has an impact on the treatment discontinuation due to lack of efficacy or side effect as documented in this biobatoderm study. Finally, um, it is particularly important to consider obesity in childhood and early adulthood since uh, it has been documented that obesity in, in early adulthood is a risk factor for developing later psoriatic arthritis. So we are facing a worldwide epidemics of overweight and obesity and the WHO has launched a global strategy to prevent obesity with these points being mentioned here. Years ago, we did a trial in overweight and obese psoriatic patients who are starting a new systemic treatment for their disease and randomized them to receive concurrently with the new medication, either a structured intervention with diet and promotion of physical exercise to reduce, to reduce weight or simple information on the importance of weight loss. And there was a significant decrease in weight in people on the active intervention, parallel by a better improvement in PASI score compared with the control group. A recent systematic review confirmed that a dietary intervention may reduce the severity of psoriasis, even if to my disappointment, I must say, the evidence was considered as of rather low quality. As a matter of fact, dermatologists are reluctant or seems to be reluctant to be involved in educational intervention as documented in this survey from the United Kingdom they are much more attracted by the possibility of modulating risk through pharmacological intervention. 
And it is well it has been documented that treatment by a biological agent and methotrexate may reduce, in fact, cardiovascular related mortality as compared with other therapy. And these data fit with the proposed impact of epithelial inflammation on the metabolic syndrome. I don't think that these data are, let's say, contradict the possibility of an additional intervention on obesity and weight loss. What about the future? In my opinion, there is a need to, to develop uh, research programs on comorbidity and to improve the proficiency of dermatologists in the area of health promotion, health education, following the model, for example, proposed by the CDC with the healthy schools. And dermatology should improve their communicational skill and be familiar with scientific approaches in the area of education, health education. Not different from therapeutic intervention, health education should be monitored according to a treat-to-target approach, modulating activities based on their ability to achieve results in a given time frame. A complementary issue is the one of patient empowerment. I have not enough time to discuss in that this point, but I think it's important to also improve patient education. And uh, I'm going to conclude. In summary, I will say that uh, I, I've lost a, a slide, but I'm going to conclude. In summary, comorbidity is a statistical concept with relevant implication, clinical implication, Psoriasis has been linked with several comorbidities, which can make disease management more complex and challenging. And in my opinion, it is worth that dermatologists take some responsibility with managing comorbidities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Luigi, for this, uh, this great uh, uh, talk. Uh, I can't see... Uh, uh, some uh, questions in the chat space. I have one for you. Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, uh, the uh, complementarity of uh, uh, an active antipsoriatic uh, treatment to improve other uh, skin conditions, and in parallel, uh, eventually, uh, the cottage of of comorbidities, um, especially the cardiovascular risk. Um, in practice, uh, um, uh, two, two sub-questions. Do you think that all, uh, especially the targeted treatment, but all antipsoriatic treatment regarding this risk reduction are uh, the same, that's first, uh, meaning that when we improve the skin inflammation, <laughs> we, we improve the cardiovascular, we decrease the cardiovascular risk, we are, you, we are, uh, improve the uh, subclinical systemic inflammation in all these patients the same way. Uh, that's that's one. And second, when you have external intervention, when do you promote that? Do you do that right away from the very beginning of the treatment, or do you wait that the patient is uh, relieved from the skin symptoms <clears throat> to address uh, this additional burden? So two. Two questions. Yeah, the, yeah th thank you for your questions. Well, first question, I think that uh, there are documentation of the impact of systemic treatment on the metabolic component uh, only for methotrexate and mainly anti-TNF inhibitors. These are the main drugs which has been studied in, let's say, in observational studies. There are no real randomized trial documenting any impact uh, uh, long term. And uh, so I think these are the two possible ways to go when deciding about a, a treatment and considering comorbidities. And uh, I think that uh, the intervention should, should be very, very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, should start very early in, uh, in, in the patient management. I'm not speaking about treatment, I'm speaking about patient management. Even, uh, even a, a, a patient with mild psoriasis who are who is uh, uh, overweight or obese need uh, uh, education. I think that uh, is something which is in, uh, in combination with the, uh, with the treatment and maybe also precede the systemic treatment. Uh, is something, and it doesn't take a long, 
I mean, we, it, there is a need to, to evaluate different strategies. It is an area very open to, to, to new uh, the, ideas for, 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 for to, to, to study in, in a randomized trial. Uh, and so uh, we are only at the beginning of that, but uh, there is a need also to motivate dermatologists to care for psoriasis, those who are, as, as uh, Peter said, uh, psoriatic enthusiastic, uh, psoriatic, psoriasis enthusiastic to, to, to consider uh, seriously the education, health education of patients. Because also at least 30% of patients with psoriasis are uh, overweight or obese. I see there is another question here, routine screening for metabolic syndrome is recommended starting from which age? Uh, is it difficult to do in infants or, or young? I don't think it's difficult. I think it's the right time to, to start also educating parents, not only, of course, the child is not educated by himself, cannot be educated directly. I think that there is a need to educate parents and then educate the, the child. And so as, as soon as possible, I would say. Yeah, so in a chronic disease, uh, uh, therapeutic education and disease education at large uh, is, is, uh, is crucial, which means probably, like you said, you suggest uh, also some transdisciplinary and uh, different uh, uh, expertise in the same outpatient clinic, which is not always uh, uh, easy to gather. Uh, so uh, we, we, we can uh, discuss again uh, this, this issue um, at the end of the webinar uh, anyway. Uh, I think, uh, uh, thank you again, uh, uh, Luigi, for your, your great talk. And it's uh, again my pleasure now to introduce the second speaker, uh, Professor Paul Henry. Uh, uh, the, in rheumatology, uh, there are uh, very good reasons uh, Ob seem to be obvious, uh, but nothing in, in, in it should be obvious. It should be science-based for early intervention. And uh, Professor Paul Emery will discuss the concept of early intervention in the context of uh, chronic in inflammatory uh, uh, rheumatological disease. Um, so thank you again, Professor Emery, for uh, being with us today. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you today uh, about early intervention in rheumatology. We have many of the same issues that you have in dermatology, and we work very closely with our dermatologists. And the same principles we've applied to rheumatoid, we're now applying entirely to what we call psoriatic disease and early psoriasis, uh, pre-psoriatic arthritis. Um, these are my disclosures. And for rheumatoid, when I started, we had a very different attitude to what we should do with our patients. It was a, a watch and wait policy. You had to earn your disease modifying anti-rheumatic drug. Uh, we now have a much more aggressive, often remission induction policy and certainly a treat to target policy. So uh, I'm gonna go through what the expectations were and whether they've been realized or not. Uh, in the 1990s and actually a little earlier, uh, I became very evangelical about treating patients early in the disease process and particularly uh, focusing on the need to get patients into remission uh, and also uh, mimicking what the oncologists already did, which was to uh, induce the, the, a remission with the disease uh, and then maintain it on less therapy. <clears throat> And so what I'm gonna be talking about is early intervention. And as I said, the initial uh, premise was to treat early to avoid damage. Uh, other subsequent advantages of this early approach were that you would get higher remission rates, uh, an ability to taper and even stop drugs, and we would avoid resistant disease. And then talking a little bit about what we do now mainly, which is actually trying to prevent the development of rheumatoid arthritis. And ideally this is guided by biomarkers, which are objective measures of the disease process. This was the cartoon that guided us uh, initially when we were trying to encourage primary care to refer early. The concept here is time on the horizontal axis and inflammation be getting more severe over time, but remaining treatable whenever you intervened. 
That contrasted with functional, you could see that as the reverse as damage. So loss of function uh, and damage was cumulative. So that at the time we were treating most patients, there was already a gap between uh, what was possible and what these patients actually achieved. And this was then lifelong with a disease that wasn't cur curable. So 25 years ago, our concept was treat early before damage occurred. And that has stood us reasonably well since. And remission became the aim of therapy. Uh, I think it's now standard that what's once required evangelical lecturing, uh, people now accept that early treatment is ideal and remission is probably the only outcome that's acceptable for a new patient treated at onset. And other things uh, uh, occur. The chance of remission is best with the first drug. So we've always suggested that use your best agent first, which is not the case uh, even for guidelines now. And we've used the oncology analogy that you get uh, remission early and then maintain it with less therapy. And I think, as I have said, remission for our patients is now a new patient presenting with inflammatory arthritis should expect to get into remission. So we'll look to see how well we've done with this. Well, here are some data. All of these are randomized double-blind trials. Uh, some are single center, some are multi-center. But the, the striking finding is at week two, 40% were in remission with a combination of, of biologic and a standard conventional synthetic DMARN. And all of these on a treat to target basis reached a remission rate of 70% or above. And if you looked on completers, it was actually much higher again. So undoubtedly the use of uh, optimal therapy at onset is very effective. The second advantage uh, is that by getting patients into remission, you can actually reduce therapy. And this was a study we did 30 years ago where the treatment period was patients were identified with what was then a, a novel uh, MRI technique. And then they were treated with biologic and methotrexate for one year, and then were managed by their physicians for the next year. The first year was double blind. And what you can see is, and we're looking at quality of life and function here, these patients who had standard therapy did not actually improve much later, whereas those who had remission induction in this open period were receiving less therapy than these and actually maintained their good function and their good quality of life, showing the importance of early suppression of inflammation. And we also found that in most of our groups, we had about 10% who did really well. This patient actually uh, took, well, I think this is eight years, yes, eight years post their remission induction, remained anti also antibody positive, had a high disease activity, but was now on no therapy and running marathons. So there is the possibility that you can re-educate the immune system. One of the studies I showed you earlier about remission was this one, uh, the PRIZE study. And I use this as an example. At the end of a remission induction period of a year, patients were randomized to receive a, a varied tapering, which was either stopping the biologic, stopping all therapies, still with a 20% response rate, or halving the therapy. And it's clear that if you get patients into remission for many of our biologics, you can certainly safely halve the therapy. And in a subsection, a subsector of those patients, you can actually stop therapy. So there's no doubt that by doing that, uh, you can actually reduce the cost by using less biologic. And of course, the ligand is reduced uh, when inflammation is less. And going back to damage, this is also from that prize study. And it shows what happens when you, this is the phase one, the open label phase, and uh, phase two, which is the double blind phase. And you can see this is uh, the various groups showing the amount of damage that occurred. Now, normally you would see damage progressing even uh, with biologic agents if they're used a little later. But here you can see there really is no damage in the double blind period, despite halving the dose, stopping it. And actually the placebo reduced its damage. So there's little risk of structural damage if you debulk the disease with remission induction, in this case with TNF inhibitor. And this placebo group actually improved despite being on no therapy at all. So the, the assumption is that if you really get 
down to very low levels of disease activity, a rather crude measure such as X-ray damage doesn't appear. And this is the most extreme uh, example, uh, an amazing study from Utrecht in uh, the Netherlands. And what you see here is the initial responses. This is patients going into remission with an IL-6 receptor um, uh, monoclonal, which is tocilizumab, with methotrexate or as monotherapy or with methotrexate alone. And even more surprising, this is sustained drug-free remission, which you see in about 40% of patients who are initially treated with tocilizumab and methotrexate. Now, the key here is these patients were treated in the first few weeks of disease, when probably they are susceptible to single cytokine uh, blockade and total uh, suppression of remission and re-education of the immune system. But there's a lot of antagonism to using first-line uh, biologics, and these are some of the arguments. So we've been trying to get around that by identifying those patients who will achieve remission on methotrexate and targeting those, targeting those who probably won't. And that's called the variety of things, including personalized medicine. And what we use actually are the frequency of naive T cells, which are probably a rather gross way of measuring the amount of, uh, of activation within the immune system. And we know if you have normal T cell frequency, your methotrexate remission rate is about four or five times that of those that don't. So when we get a new patient, we do our biomarker and it's about 50-50. If they have normal T cell response, they get a uh, standard treatment and they would be expected to get remission in about 80% of cases. Now this is actually uh, a proof of concept study. So we do actually randomize the ones with abnormal results. We expect these to be about 50 or 60% uh, and that to be about 20%. But we're, this was held up by COVID as you can imagine, but it's nearing its completion, and if its, if it's predict predictions are true, we get, will get about 70% remission rates, but with only half the patients requiring a biologic, which would answer some of the criticisms. The, the final advantage is it avoids resistance. We, ha we have a, now a large resistant clinic where the, uh, patients will have failed up to 14 biologics or targeted synthetic drugs, and within that clinic, there isn't a patient who had the remission reduction regime suggesting, but not proving, of course, that that actually does avoid this resistance late. And the mechanisms for this include probably, as I've mentioned, debulking disease, but by preventing an inflammatory drive, there's less push down other signaling pathways. <clears throat> and we know later in disease, there are multiple signaling pathways. And we have shown there's reduced epigenetic change as well, which may well be important. So patients go from being responsive to a single cytokine blockade early to requiring much more complex blockade late. So our expectations, well, I think early intervention, uh, if you treat early, you do avoid damage. We have seen higher emission rates. We have permitted tapering and less convincing, but I think is still uh, likely that we do avoid resistant disease. And finally, I'll just say a little bit about really early intervention. Uh, as was mentioned, um, we periodontitis is a key initiating factor in rheumatoid. We've shown that it, uh, it's largely due to P. gingivalis and it precedes any joint involvement whatsoever. It was always thought it could be disability that was a problem. We also have changes in the lung, some due to smoking, but again, uh, uh, pad activity is present. Uh, of course, P. gingivalis can citronellate proteins and it has an en endocitronellase, which could change the proteins to allow uh, the anti-citronellated autoantibodies to occur. And we've shown quite clearly that there's dysbiosis in the gut in the same patients and the phyla of the, the, those uh, uh, changes in the gut actually associated with those that progress to rheumatoid arthritis. And we've had this sort of model of, of the continuum of rheumatoid with shared epitope, smoking, uh, producing autoantibodies, then gradually moving along the, the spectrum to uh, clinical arthritis. And that was our model 10 years ago. What we know now is that we have this first hit where there's localized autoantibodies, which then, if they're allowed to persist, produce systemic autoantibodies. 
We have non-specific symptoms, and importantly, we've re just recently shown that the extended autoantibody profile occurs at this stage before there's even any subclinical disease. And we have, therefore, because these are the patients we can identify with this extended autoantibody profile, which we do on our national program, uh, at this window of opportunity before there's any involvement, and that's including ultrasound or MRI evidence of involvement. So intervening at this stage, one would hope, would prevent even subclinical joint involvement. And with uh, an, an even better opportunity, because the first thing that happens isn't the joint itself, but the periarticular tissues that get involved, as, as again has been recently shown. So joint involvement is very late in rheumatoid. That's our model in 21. So rheumatoid is the end of a continuum. Uh, the phenotype of the individual should decide therapy at each stage, and this should include precision medicine if, if you can, and it provides potential to intervene to halt regression before joint involvement. And most expectations have been met when correct approach used. And finally, uh, something which I didn't think was going to happen in my lifetime, that blockade of uh, inflammation with monoclonal antibodies may well be cost effective. What I've shown you is the, those results of using a, a biologic DMAR for 12 months with remission induction, and we'd probably do it for around 90%, but if you did biomarkers, perhaps only with 50%. The alternative is what we currently do if we follow NHS guidelines, is treat them with conventional drugs till they have a level of disease activity, and currently we're treating about 60% of our patients uh, uh, who go through this pathway, and these patients never come off the biologic. And for 100 patients, the cost of that, if we assume uh, that uh, a biologic for us is around 5,000 uh, uh, pounds per annum, but our cheapest um, uh, biosimilar, uh, adalimumab, uh, is actually uh, 2,000. So we have the opportunity. First-line biologics could be cost-effective and also possibly, I'd suggest, quite good medicine. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. That was uh, really um, uh, a really great talk, and uh, there, there are already some 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 questions from uh, um, Rani Sonen. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if we if we diagnose a patient in this early time window for psoriasis, it can take years before patients are properly diagnosed to start of biologic therapy and may not be as early as we think or believe. So the question behind is when, uh, you, you alluded to that, when uh, is the uh, window of opportunity um, to uh, um, uh, hopefully uh, not only prevent uh, uh, tissue damage, but uh, increase the likelihood to have durable, uh, uh, complete remission and eventually without drug therapy. And that the second question, uh, uh, are there some identified biomarkers for these patients who will do well uh, after treatment withdrawal so far um, in uh, joint disease? Uh, these are the questions for you. Um, well, there's a number of questions there. I think the our interest in psoriasis is slightly different because our main ambition is to stop psoriatic arthritis but and we but we've also been interested and i think liv is going to talk about this skin memory and whether you can avoid that by early very aggressive therapy and there's in in this month's uh, annals rheumatic diseases there's uh, three articles or studies showing the benefit of early intervention with long lasting out, outcome benefits way beyond that uh, in psoriatic arthritis way beyond just the period of time of treatment um, in terms of predicting who is going to do well and remain in remission, uh, it's fascinating because it's sort of the reverse of what happens at the beginning. Uh, at the beginning, you have autoantibodies, then you have uh, detectable changes in the, the joints, and then immunological abnormalities such as the T-cell changes. And when you get patients better, they do it in reverse. 
So they, they actually get the rid of the joint, then the immuno immunology. And the patients who have normal immunology, we have a remission, uh, which is called uh, multi-dimensional remission, which includes the imaging and the immunology. And if, and if they, they have those, they have a very good chance of being able to stop therapy. So it does appear you can, to some extent, uh, I wouldn't overemphasize this, but if you treat early enough, to some extent, re-educate the immune system to, to have its own homeostasis. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you. And that, that's something we can discuss at the end of uh, all, uh, 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 all speakers' talk, because uh, that would be very interesting to have a sort of uh, a cross vision. Um, uh, th there is a, a very practical question. I'm not sure that this is really uh, the focus of your talk is the pest the psoriasis epidemiology screening tool enough for screening of PSA? How frequent should the screening be? Uh, maybe, <clears throat> do you want to, uh, to, yeah. to discuss uh, briefly? We use the PEST all the time in our uh, psoriasis patients. Um, what we're not clear, actually, because the patients who are PEST positive uh, then get ultrasound as a routine. And we're just gathering the information on how prevalent subclinical diseases in those who, who score uh, normally on the PEST. Um, we can't give you those data yet, but we certainly use the PEST and we think it's very valuable. I think the proof that, it's, uh, that, it, that PEST negative is, is safe to leave alone still remains. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. And that, um, again, thanks from, from, from the dermatology community and we, we cherish this uh, close relationship with the, uh, the rheumatology community. Um, um, and now it's the, the, the time for uh, the, the, the last, uh, uh, but not the very least, talk of, uh, of this, uh, this webinar. Uh, so again, it's my great pleasure to introduce, to reintroduce um, Professor Liv Etzmo. She will address um, a, a science-based uh, real concept, um, which is uh, the uh, inflammation memory uh, around T cell doesn't exist only uh, around T cells, but LIV has been um, uh, absolutely instrumental uh, delivering some disruptive discoveries in this field. So we are eagerly looking forward to your talk, uh, uh, LIV. What is missing uh, regarding uh, uh, disease memory and the science behind it? Thank you very much for this kind um, introduction and for the invitation to talk here today. So uh, I just want to point out, this is where I work at the Leo Foundation Skin Immunology Center at the um, University of Copenhagen. Please come and visit. So my disclaimers are not many, but there's a clinical study that I am involved in. I will mention this a little bit and it's um, hosted by Novartis. Talking about psoriasis or any immune-mediated disease, um, and also as a dermatologist, it's important to remember how dynamic these diseases are. So a disease like psoriasis will appear in a patient of a certain genetic background, but that is not enough. There will also be environmental triggers, may they be stress or infections or a lot of things we, we don't really understand very well. And at some point there will be a trigger that will induce focal chronic skin inflammation. Typically not all over the body, but in certain spots. And here you can see a picture from a patient from a, a recent paper from Monastolas Biobank in, at Karolinska in Stockholm, where this patient had a very mild phenotype at onset and 10 years after um, just being part of this Biobank, this patient came back in a, in a horrific state completely untreated and a very severe phenotype. And comparing some 500 patients with plaque psoriasis, this is a very typical uh, setup of, of the uh, disease uh, manifestations. 65% of the patients had a mild disease, some 35 had moderate to severe disease. It was very interesting to follow on the right-hand side after 10 years, that up to 20% of the patients, typically patients with uh, presenting with mild disease uh, at the beginning of the study, had minimal disease activity defined as no psoriasis for the last two years. Most of the mild uh, patients 
maintain the phenotype. Some of the more moderate patients had improved, and then a few patients had gone into the more severe phenotype. So we do have a very dynamic disease, but what is also very clear in the clinics is that when patients come with a, a focal skin inflammation, and in this skin inflammation, there will be quite an intense inflammation with in green here, inflammatory dendritic cells, in blue, uh, inflammatory T cells, in red, we have the Langerhorn cells, which are resident in the skin and stay there all the time, and they don't really expand during psoriasis. But most importantly, you can see the intense hyperproliferation of the epithelia of the epidermis. So altogether, it is a very intense tissue inflammation um, that is caused by several different um, immune cells together with stroma cells. Nevertheless, we're very successful at treating psoriasis nowadays, may it be with a topical agent such as cortisone or UVB treatment or all the biologics that we have. And the patients come back and very often we cannot tell where the patients had the disease. And I think this brings back the beauty of uh, dermatology as a medical specialty as compared to gastroenterology or um, internal medicine, because we can remember and the patients more importantly remembers where they had their disease. So when the disease comes back, it typically comes back at the same site. Sometimes it will spread to different parts of the body. Uh, sometimes in a very inflammatory stage, we also see the Kerbner phenomena where patient following physical uh, interference, I once had a patient coming after his sons had been shooting him with a pea gun. So he had little peas on his belly. And this is a very inflammatory uh, phenotype of psoriasis that proves to us that there's also a circulatory component uh, of the disease. So it, it can be reintroduced in new uh, places on the uh, skin costume. So the whole concept of uh, disease memory or localized disease scars has been very anecdotal. And for a long time, I was looking for proof for someone who had been um, really mapping lesions before and after resolution. It has been very difficult to find. Um, fixed drug eruption has been well um, um, documented in the same sites after very long times of resolution. Psoriasis, contact allergy and vitiligo, we know they come back in the same sites. Atopic dermatitis is a little bit more uh, of a mobile uh, dermatosis. But I was very happy um, a few years back when Lars Iversen in Horhus University published uh, this paper where a small cohort, but still of patients were followed very closely before and after climatotherapy. So these patients went to the Dead Sea uh, to get um, just a few weeks of sunshine and uh, salty baths, and they all resolved beautifully, as you can see uh, in the bottom, in the middle. But when the disease came back some 12 weeks after um, they came back from, from their uh, climatotherapy, the plaques came back at the same sites in some 60% of, of these patients. Small study, but still just proving the point that for some reason, patients do not have random um, uh, recurrence of disease in the skin costume. Previously affected sites will be more affected. So why is this? Uh, and why, coming back to the intense immune infiltration, uh, it has long been known that a never lesional skin, skin in psoriasis patients that have not previously been affected by psoriasis, behaves a little bit differently immunologically. They have more psoriasis formed T cells, they have more um, uh, of an inflammatory phenotype. In resolved skin, uh, the Krieger lab early on showed that, that there is a molecular scarring. So when sampling skin up to 12 weeks after resolution of disease, there was an overrepresentation of gene transcripts that were um, associated with T cell biology and also with psoriasis inflammation. And as I mentioned uh, before in fixed drug eruption, um, it has been clearly shown that T cells are retained for a long time in resolved uh, lesions. And when we look into the skin, of patients and 
healthy people, there is a distinct population of T cells in the epidermis that is distributed all over the body. These T cells stay for a long time. They are closely interacting with the basement membrane that separates epidermis and dermis. And on top of that, there is a lot of patrolling and resident T cells also in the dermis. As a proof of principle, Jörg Prince uh, in the 90s already uh, in Munich treated patients with, a, this is a um, pustular psoriasis, where there's a lot of neutrophils in the skin. Depleting T cells from these patients would lead to complete uh, disease resolution, just showing how important T cells are to maintain uh, psoriasis in uh, patients. So we went into the result skin after years of resolution after biologic treatments with uh, primarily anti-TNF, but also anti-AL1223 uh, uh, blockers. And what you can see here in the bottom is the result skin, where there are small hotspots of T cells, always closely related to Langerhans cells, as compared to the lesional skin, where there is still an intense inflammation. When we looked at the AL17 producing capacity of T cells, in healthy skin, we found some 4% of resident T cells that express AL17 when they're stimulated. In the result skin, and this particular patient had been without in the resolution for some four years uh, during TNF uh, blocking therapies, one third of the CD8 cells in epidermis was still responding with AL17 production when activated. And of course, in the lesional, there are many, many AL17 producing uh, T cells. So looking at several different markers, we found a subset of, of um, T cells expressing CCR6, L23 receptor and CD103 in resolved lesions, very close to Langerhans cells overexpressing L23. So where does this bring us? We, we know that there's a subset of T cells in the skin, but we still didn't know if this subset of T cells would drive, drive psoriasis inflammation, or if the setup of resident T cells could tell us anything about um, whether these patients would remain in remission or not. So to test this, uh, we built a very simple assay where T cells in the skin, in skin biopsies, were activated by uh, adding T cell agonistic antibodies and uh, gene expression profiles were analyzed uh, both in epidermis and dermis. The T cell reached the targets. You can see that the um, T cell uh, antibody that we used, OPT3, were co-localized with T cells in epidermis and activating healthy lesional and resolved skin induced a number of different transcripts where a number of transcripts were shared regardless of the origin of the skin. We call these co-responses and they're often related to interferon gamma responses, responses we need to combat viral infections. On the other hand, psoriasiform responses were found in, in patients uh, with result psoriasis. And interestingly, this was a tiny little uh, study with nine patients, but we found that if the patients had more dominant responses with AL17 related responses, the time before relapse was shorter as compared to patients that responded more with interferon gamma uh, related responses. So this brings us to a situation where in psoriasis, we have a T cell population that is slightly changed. The balance between interferon gamma and AL17 producing cells are, um, are just skewed towards AL17 production and activating these cells will lead to psoriasiform inflammation. Now, what is missing? To me as a clinician, it's really, this is all very nice and neat um, and interesting tissue immunology, but we really don't know how to implement these scientific findings to clinical practice. And to me as a scientist, I am right now very interested in what keeps resident T cells alive within the skin. Why did they stay there so long term? Can we somehow exchange them to more uh, homeostatic T cells? So one thing that comes out of this is it's, it would be very, very um, attempting to try to target the resident T cells simply by eradicating them to go from this relapsing phenotype of psoriasis to a more um, long-term remission. 
Again, coming back to the dynamic phenotype of psoriasis, I think this might be difficult um, treating real-time patients. But another thing that has been fascinating me for time are these patients with spontaneous resolution. Would they have a different subset of T-cells? And could we um, somehow use knowledge uh, from such samples to understand more about the more homeostatic uh, environment for resident T-cells. Uh, I mentioned that I am involved in a clinical trial. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Yes, and coming back to uh, Paul Lemmer's uh, wonderful presentation on early intervention, of course, this is something that I feel we should do in dermatology as well, but it's, a, it's, it's complicated to do because the diseases often um, start as mild and then uh, progress with time. But I am part of a study, as I uh, mentioned previously, where patients with quite a severe phenotype, they have uh, passing more than 10, are put on uh, anti-L17 treatment uh, within a year of onset of disease. And we follow uh, resident T-cell uh, reactivity to activation to look for a potential biomarker. Potentially, this could help us uh, long term. Uh, finally, going from a skin phenotype to psoriasis arthritis, there's a lot of discussions right now, which I find fascinating, of psoriasis arthritis as a deep tissue carbonate. So if psoriasis arthritis would be a consequence of deep carbonate, could we somehow address circulating pathogenic TRM cells to stop new um, disease scars from forming? Um, and with this, I would just like to uh, finish with thanking again for the invitation and to say that there's a whole lot of work to be done um, when it comes to disease uh, memories in the skin in order to bring them to clinical practice. Thank you very much, uh, Liv, uh, for this uh, great presentation, um, which is uh, open for discussion. Um, I can't see some uh, question in this space, the chat space or the q and I will, maybe I could start. Um, and uh, do you, in, in, this, uh, in this concept, and we know there are some, 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 some models where the primary uh, uh, genetic abnormality uh, is uh, targeting a keratinocyte uh, uh, express antigen. Let's say, let's take the example of the CART14 associated uh, uh, psoriatic disease. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, and, and, and where there is uh, um, an enhanced uh, TH17 uh, response deregulated, uh, uh, fitting very well with what, what, what you showed with your group. So do you r rule out uh, the uh, uh, the uh, hypothesis that in some patients where you have uh, a, a primary uh, genetically de determined abnormality, uh, basically inhibiting the uh, TH17 uh, deregulated uh, uh, response might not work on the long run in a subset of these patients because the underlying uh, keratinocyte uh, uh, abnormality remains. Um, that's my, my a little bit provocative question for you. Uh, but I think, way... yeah, but I think this is also what Paul Emery talked about when we are now getting, you know, clinics for patients that have been resistant to uh, all these cytokine driven therapies. So it's all very good to, you know, stop the molecular signaling between T cells. But if you still have the underlying problem, you might just switch from one pathway to another. And my problem is that we need, we need the T-cells around. I don't think it's as simple as, as just eradicating pathogenic T-cells. We need to somehow reprogram the whole tissue. And how do we do that in a, a good and long-term way? Because I, I think with some patients, they do very well with biologics for many, many years. But we do have the other subsets and, 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 and especially the mild disease, would there be a smarter way to try to reset the tissue homeostasis there? So I agree yeah. with you. I, I, you know, I don't think that, that uh, biologics is, is always the, 
answer. Thank you, Liv. And uh, a second question for you is that uh, let's take the uh, clinical situation of a banal um, staph aureus infection. We know that it's uh, uh, it's uh, less frequent in in patients with psoriasis, but let's uh, you know uh, some infection occurs, and then there is a recruitment, fortunately, of uh, of, of immune cells and expansion and production of the cytokine, uh, including IL seventeen. Are these cells? Did you have some some um, insights or um, scientific uh, uh, results uh, comparing these these uh, um, T cells recruited for uh, towards infection sites uh, with the, the uh, lesional or resolved uh, psoriatic skin uh, uh, resident T uh, seventeen cells, which are deregulated? In other words, if it had, I mean. Fortunately, we, we we are fortunate that we have these uh, TH17 uh, uh, resident me memory cells. Uh, when 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 infection occurs, is is there any trained uh, immunity memory, which is a a, a very kind of uh, contemporary concept because trained immunity uh, is. Uh, applies for many cells, not only the uh, adaptive immune system, but also the innate immune system. So I was wondering uh, if, if you check from some, some TH17 cells recruited by, by the site of infection as a stuff in indirect comparison. No, I mean, we're, we're really getting into this now. So, so basically for a long time, we were thinking that the perfect treatment would be some microbiota cream that would drive the right resident T cells in the skin and how would we form that? So it's, it's something we have been playing around with a lot in, in my lab, just thinking about ways to design such a trial. But I think that I'm not sure, I would rather call them contextual rather than pathogenic. So the T cells in psoriasis, even though we know some antigens that they respond to, but we, it's a very heterogeneous population. And I think now when we're getting into single cell and where we can really start to track the TCRs, we start to understand how heterogeneous the population are. So the AL17 cells that are there, they might well respond to um, common microbiota. We, we just don't know. Thank you, Liv. Thank you. Agree. And, and uh, any, uh, um, I can't see uh, any final question. I, I, I'm checking the uh, chat space. Uh, sorry. Uh, um, um, I would like to invite uh, each and every one of you to, for a last uh, comment. Maybe, um, uh, would you like to start, uh, Luigi? Um, uh, regarding uh, how, uh, maybe, maybe I, I would have a question for you. Um, that would be uh, my last challenge for, 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 for you. So Luigi, uh, do you think that uh, in regard to uh, what uh, Professor Emery and Etsmo and yourself addressed, uh, do you think that um, all kinds of uh, uh, intervention that works, you know, I'd say a very rustic term, uh, clinically speaking, uh, would lead to a global improvement of all the uh, inflammatory burden associated comorbidities the same this way. This is a or huge you, or, question. <laughs> huge question. You have one minute. You have one minute, Luigi. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm unable to, to answer. I would say that uh, there is a need for a combination of efforts from different areas. Uh, from the, I think the epidemiology is still providing data, is still providing, I think the role of the uh, adipose tissue is important uh, and uh, the link between psoriasis and uh, obesity is preceding the development of psoriasis and also the development of arthritis. I think that we need to concentrate at least on this aspect uh, and uh, let's say work on that uh, in combination with, uh, let's say, data from the immunological area and maybe biomarkers from there. Um, I think we need a randomized trial of uh, disease prevention in people who are likely to develop severe condition starting uh, from the beginning of their disease with, when they have very limited involvement, being aggressive by systemic treatment, moving from the idea of starting 
when the patient has moderate to severe psoriasis, but just moving back to considering uh, stopping the uh, inflammatory loop very early. In people who have signs or, or sign and who have immunological marker of possible uh, progression, it's difficult. But uh, this is the challenge. Thank you, Lu thank you, Luigi. Uh, Paul, would you like to add um, something uh, to uh, for for a close? Um, I suppose I, the argument about whether to use biologics or not, I don't think, is one that you need to uh, uh, to get into. Anything that works is is, I think, equally effective. But no one's ever shown that the remission that you get truly with with uh, one drug is better than another. The problem is.